Good afternoon, and welcome to the we this webinar, Power Your Coatings with Graphene Nanotubes, Conductivity, Durability, Color, and Cost Efficiency. This event, brought to you by Paint and Coatings Industry, is sponsored by Oxyl. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm your moderator, Tom Fowler, publisher of Paint and Coatings Industry. Thanks for joining us today. Today's presenter is Ian Fellows. Ian is the CEO of Oxyl Americas LLC and has been with the company for eight years. Prior to joining Oxyl, Ian worked as a tier one composites supplier to the automotive industry. Ian will be joined by one of his colleagues from Oxyl for expanded formulation discussions at the end of this presentation. Don't forget to submit your questions and later in the program, uh, our presenter will address as many as possible. Today's event is being recorded and archived on our website, www.pcimag.com. And now I'm excited to turn over uh, the presentation to Ian Fellows. Thank you, Tom. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Power Your Coatings with Graphene Nanotubes. My name is Ian Fellows. I am the leader of the Americas operation for Oxyl. Oxyl is a global producer of single wall graphene nanotubes, which we promote in the coatings industry as a conductive additive. Today, I'll talk to you about how two ball graphene nanotubes, our product, outperform traditional conductive additives available in the coatings marketplace today. Specifically, we'll talk about them quickly over six key criteria which we think are important for the performance of conductive coatings, including the ability to differentiate by color, the ability to preserve mechanical properties, the ratio of cost to performance, the ease of use in your formulation and in your factories, the ability to produce a chemically resistant, stable performing coating for the life of the product, and being able to do this without any negative influence on rheology. As we start to chat, chart these key criteria with some of the more traditional additives, you can see why we consider two ball to be a superior choice for your conductive coatings. In addition, you'll start to see how two ball graphene nanotubes are one of the most sustainable conductive additives that you can choose today. And this is because two ball allows you to manufacture a higher performance and prolonged service life product with less raw materials required. And all of this really flows from the fact that we require a working dosage of typically less than a fifth of a percent by weight. At this very low loading, we're able to differentiate by color. We don't get in the way of the mechanical properties of the native neat resins we're blending into. And our cost per set of properties is competitive and in many cases superior to traditional materials like conductive carbon blacks or conductive mica. And so in this way, we'll help your company and your products take the next step towards carbon neutrality, neutrality, excuse me, because you're gonna be able to do more with less material, thereby reducing your energy consumption, extending the durability, and demonstrating better environmental compliance as a product and as an organization. So I'll spend about the next 10 or 15 minutes, we're gonna be intentionally brief to allow more time for question and answers, but talking through the, the following table of contents, I'll give you some background on our company. We'll talk through the three main key pillar performance uh, criteria, which is electrical conductivity, mechanical reinforcement and color. We'll talk about some additional benefits. We'll share some success stories, uh, places where our clients globally have introduced two ball in their conductive coatings with success. And then lastly, I'll give you a little bit of background about the company. So the best way to visualize what a graphene nanotube is, is to start by thinking of a single sheet of graphene, which is one atom thick, rolled into a seamless cylinder, as you can see in the animation here. An individual two ball graphene nanotube has a diameter of about 1.6 nanometers, but it has a length of five microns. And that is key to understand the geometry and the performance of a product. It's what's called the aspect ratio. It's the ratio of the length to the diameter. And in the case of two ball, our aspect ratio is greater than 3000. If I was able to take an individual two ball nanotube and stretch it to physical dimensions that you could perceive and understand better, this would be like a single garden hose, the length of a football field. 
except we can load millions of them into your coatings at less than a gram by weight. So when you understand the geometry and then you understand what the material consists of, you start to get a sense of what a remarkable novel conductive additive this can be for your coating system. And that's because the, con the content of a two ball graphene nanotube is a sheet of graphene that's as conductive as copper, but only one fifth of the weight. An individual nanotube is 100 times stronger than steel. And we're able to reach a percolation threshold, electrical performance properties, at a loading level, as I said, between 0.02 to 0.05 weight percent in most coating systems. As a result, two wall presents itself with an unparalleled, unmatched set of properties and benefits. So the first and foremost reason that two balls being introduced to conductive coatings is to deliver a full range of electrical resistivity. As I said on the previous slide, typically between 0.02 to 0.05% by weight, two ball can deliver a full range of electrical resistivity anywhere from conductive, you know, 10 to the four to the 10 to the six, to ESD 10, six to 10, nine, to just regular conductive 10, nine to 10, 11. In all cases, two ball does this permanently. It doesn't migrate to the surface. It doesn't leach out over time. It does this stably, uh, homogeneous performance across the entire surface of the coating. And it does it without hot spots and some of the other problems that come with uh, traditional materials that can agglomerate in certain, certain areas and cause arcing and, and burn marks, et cetera. I keep using the arrow. So as I mentioned, all of our benefits really stem from the unique geometry and the unique features of two ball. And that includes the ability to differentiate by color. Because we're only putting less than a half of a percent by weight of solids into your system for electrical functionality, with the use of pigments, you're enabled, your coating is enabled to differentiate by color. As you can see here, here is a RAL color change of green and red as you increase your loading of two ball. Very small dosage uh, of our nanotubes plus pigmenting allow you to create different colors. And so you might imagine in a very competitive space, you could create a conductive coating that matches the branding of your customer. This might be a unique feature that none of the other suppliers can manage. Or maybe keeping with this theme of, of, of green and red, you could create one coating that indicates past assemblies, things that have passed, and red, things that have failed and require rework. Uh, so there's a lot more that you can do, a lot more functionality and a lot more differentiation that you can deliver by using our nanotubes to create electrical conductivity in your coating. In addition, as we mentioned earlier, we don't get in the way of the native performance of the neat resins that we're blending into. We've been able to independently verify this in our lab and the labs of our partners through a suite of ISO certified tests, which I think will be familiar to most people here. But that's about adhesion, adhesion to the substrate, uh, impact resistance, crack resistance. In all of these instances, uh, two ball shows no appreciable change to the mechanicals of the resins we're blending into. Some of the additional benefits we like to talk about, stable chemical resistance. Uh, two ball nanotubes are inert in nature, non-reactive. And so as part of a coating system, they provide stable chemical resistance for the lifetime of your coating. And we've been able to verify this by soaking it in crude oil and various solvent materials like gasoline, ethanol, water. In every instance, coatings with two ball have passed key chemical resistance tests. In addition, one of the key benefits that we see with two ball is the ability to easily introduce it into your formulation and into your factory. We synthesize the material as a powder, uh, but honestly that powder can be challenging to work with both from an industrial safety perspective and from the pure task of just introducing enough shear to debundle the nanotubes. So frequently what we're delivering to our coatings customers around the world is some sort of predispersed form of two ball. Most notably, we have resin concentrates. We call those two ball matrix. And that's a small percentage of our nanotubes blended into a large percentage of a carrier resin, which we have chosen to be compatible with the most prevalent commercial systems out there today. We also can blend two ball into deionized water, which we call coat E. Uh, this is an even smaller amount of, of our nanotubes, a bit of a surfactant and deionized water. 
So whether you purchase the matrix from us or you purchase coat E, what you get is our predispersed nanotubes that can be let down into your system via standard mixing. Uh, this is an overhead mixer with a kind of aggressive blade. We require about a half an hour to, for both stages of dilution time, nothing uh, extraordinarily uh, punitive to your current process. And in terms of quality control, uh, we're looking to measure the size of the particulates and how well you've knocked them down. So we typically use a grindometer, also known as a Hegman gauge. And we're just trying to see that the particles are below 15 microns in size, which works for most conductive coatings that don't have any kind of optical property requirements. This next slide is kind of busy. And if you want to put your comments in the chat, just say selection guide with your email and I can send this table to you uh, after the presentation. But this is to show you the, the family of products we have for the resin concentrates, which you see our two ball matrix with a, with a three digit number there. And then at the bottom, the two liquid dispersions we have in deionized water. And this is a selection guide. And as you can see, as I mentioned, you know, we, we have solutions for epoxy, polyesters, vinyl esters, urethanes, et cetera, all of the, the most common commercial resin systems we see available in the market today. We have easy to use, uh, ready to go solutions uh, for all of these. So just to kind of summarize the, the, the benefits set before we kind of move to the next chapter, you know, two ball allows you to make a better coating with less material, thereby enabling you to have a better product that can be differentiated and also helps your company take steps towards being uh, more environmentally compliant and, and having a more sustainable product offering. And we do this because we, we are a large industrial global company with consistent quality. Because we have such a limited influence on rheology, a lot of our customers don't require so much solvent to go back into their system to adjust for viscosity. Because we require just a tiny amount, your logistics in terms of bringing our product in, stocking it, and then shipping out a fully loaded system will be more efficient and less costly. And because we give you so much of the available volume of your material back to you, you have a lot more flexibility in terms of other functional additives you want to add, or again, trying to get back to the native mechanical properties of the neat resins you're blending into. So it looks like we're still on track in terms of time. Quickly, I'll go through some success stories. These are customers of ours, customers of ours around the world that are using two ball and conductive coatings. Our first customer is, is, is a European organization. We're prevented by sh to sharing their name because of NDA but they're making an anti-static tank lining coating uh, for large facilities that store solvent and flammable materials in them. And what they were able to do is take a formulation, an old formulation that contained 25% conductive mica and swap that out for 0.03 weight percent of our nanotubes. Obviously this dramatically improved the performance of the coating in terms of deposition and cure and flow, taking out that many solids. But in addition, two ball was able to achieve all of the necessary conductivity, whether it's volume resistivity or surface resistivity. But the most exciting part was this customer was now able to make a very light gray tank lining coating. And so this helped their contractors in terms of deposition because they're going over a dark primer layer so they can very easily see where their coverage is too light, where they need to put some more in. But then in addition, the contractor's customer, the end user, really appreciated this color differentiation because they can visually look into the tank now and see the contrast between the material being sorted, stored in there and the color of the coating. So it, it had a, a, a suite of benefits that flowed all the way down to the end user. And I think that's what we're all looking for in these kind of instances. Next, very quickly, a customer of ours from Switzerland, Konica, is making ESD and anti-static flooring. This flooring is frequently used in places where there's electronics assembly. You know, you're putting together chips or other sensitive materials. Places where there is automated package handling and you've got robots that move around on the floor. And in some extremes, places where you're storing ammunition and solvent borne materials that, that require care and, and anti-sparking properties. Konica uh, makes a epoxy-based system, 0.05% of our nanotubes. Same set of, of uh, in principle of properties and benefits, you know, able to achieve all the necessary regulatory standards, able to do it without hot spots, and now able to do it in colors. And, and the color is, is an interesting one. We have a customer here in the US, uh, large food service company, and they're able to match their branding for the first time and make a colored floor that, that matches the theme. 
it gave them a competitive advantage in, in a very crowded space. Here's a name that I think a lot of people would recognize. This is PPG in Germany. And I should mention that this specific application isn't in full production yet, but has gone through uh, lab-based evaluations. And what PPG is trying to do is make a waterborne acrylic primer to go over molded thermoplastic parts that are being used in the transportation industry. So if you're an OEM in the transportation industry, you wanna paint all of your panels at the same time in the same eco process. So they all match the same color and luster. And to get an insulative thermoplastic part to have the right paint transfer efficiency on that line, you need a conductive primer to go on first. And so the traditional approaches involved, involved uh, high quantities of, of carbon black powder, which took away from the rheology and the mechanicals. They were able to replace that with our two ball graphene nanotubes. Now they achieve the proper amount of conductivity, which is the right amount of paint transfer efficiency. But in addition, because this coating isn't black and it's not dark gray, it's much easier to put a top coat on there of a bright color and use less top coat. For instance, you see this white bumper in the middle. You can imagine how much paint it might take to, to go over a black bumper as opposed to a light gray bumper. So again, the, the, the value, the, the benefits, the advantages flow all the way down to the end user. They require less top coat. Well, that's material savings. That's VOC savings. So the plant can operate longer and so on. Quickly, the last success story we wanted to share with you is in powder coating. This is a client of ours, Helios, based in Slovenia. They have a powder coating that is, I understand, part epoxy and part thermoplastic. Uh, it's a primer. It's applied via a twin screw extrusion process. And similar to, to all the other cases, what, what Helios appreciates with us is the ability to differentiate by color, the ability to get permanent and stable conductivity, and to do so without getting in the way of the rest of the properties of the resin. So intentionally we were brief in this and we wanted to share places where we had regular sales going. But one of the reasons that we also have this webinar is encourage you to contact us with your new ideas uh, for innovative uses of our nanotubes. And I'll give you a couple of those just to spark some thought. We have several customers that are using the nanotubes for resistive heating or electro heating. Uh, an electrical field applied to the nanotubes creates heat and then that heat is then used to de-ice surfaces to warm cockpits and, and uh, interiors of automotive uh, assemblies. This is an exciting opportunity for us. And uh, there are a lot of places where traditional resistive heating can't get there. And so that's one for us that's fun. Gel coats and mold coats, uh, when applied, when making a tool for molding or a gel coat that's conductive, operators can demold quicker. They don't have to deal with static so much. Less dust is attracted to the mold in the mating surface, so the tool lasts longer and you get a better quality part. Conductive inks, conductive, inks, conductive coatings, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity for us to do new and innovative and exciting things, and we welcome you to approach us with those ideas. Oh, one more, self-sensing. You've got uh, an assembly of parts, let's say pipes, for instance, joined with a conductive adhesive. Now that entire assembly can be measured and the resistance is known. Then if that resistance changes suddenly, it signals operators uh, the need to investigate. Something's happened. So it's self-sensing. Uh, this is an exciting field that uh, we're pursuing as well. Okay, very quickly, intentionally brief again, some background on our company. As I said, our name is Oxial. We were built around a revolutionary concept of continuous synthesis of these single wall carbon nanotubes. The majority of the industry then and today does things in batch processes and, and batch obviously has limitations in terms of scale, cost basis, re reproducibility. So uh, one of our founders came up with this revolutionary concept, spent a few years perfecting it. And in 2010, we launched our company headquartered in Luxembourg. Nowadays, we are truly a global organization with more than 450 people working worldwide. We estimate we represent about 97% of the world's capacity for just single wall graphene nanotubes. But thanks to this remarkable technology, we have more than 80 patents pending between ourselves and our partner stakeholders uh, around the use of this technology. Truly a global organization. I'm based in Columbus, Ohio. That's where we manage the Americas. I have peers in Europe, and in Asia that are doing the same thing. We have synthesis and converted production capabilities 
strategically located around the world uh, with intent to continue to grow to, to match the demand of our customer base. Very importantly, uh, we have a full-time EHS and regulatory staff, and uh, they make sure that we are subscribed and approved in all the major markets to be used as a conductive additive. So, namely for the US, that means we have approval with the EPA to be used in, in, in this manner. Similarly, for in Europe, we have REACH approval. And all the other industrialized nations where there is some sort of regulatory path, um, we are underway or have completed uh, so that you can use our materials safely and legally in those uh, areas where you operate. Lastly, before I'll turn it over, uh, we operate very modern uh, production equipment all under the, the, the principles and, and uh, procedures uh, dedicated, uh, dictated by ISO. So all of our plants are ISO certified. In addition, one of our largest dispersion facilities is on the cusp of receiving IATF certification as well. So uh, we're very familiar with, with high quality, high capacity manufacturing. So as I said, this was intentionally brief, uh, meant to spur conversation. I'm gonna hand this back over to Tom and I'm gonna be joined now by my colleague, Vladimir. Vladimir Kravchenko is a technical leader for our company based in our headquarters in Luxembourg. And between the two of us, we look forward to answering whatever questions you have. Thank you, Tom, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Ian, for a great presentation. And as you said, we've got time for uh, some questions that were submitted uh, during the presentation. Our first question is, do you get full dispersion with high speed with a high speed disperser or will you need a medial mill? Okay. Uh, so, so, so uh, yeah, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yes, it's our pleasure uh, to see you and get your questions during this webinar. So, Tom, thank you very much for your uh, question. Yes, uh, as I see the first question related to the mixing. Yes. So basically, as uh, Ian yes. already explained, our tubo matrix as the technology was designed. Uh, so you just need a high speed mixer. Yes, there, is, there are sometimes one mixing stage or two mixing stage with some premix or without. But basically, uh, tubo nanotubes, or in this case, it's, let's say it's, it's more correct to say uh, tubo matrix predispersed concentrates. Yes, uh, the high speed mixer is enough. But at the same time, I would like to add that if for your specific needs, yes, for example, right now you have bead mill, uh, we can provide some recommendations how to disperse tubo matrix with your bead mill equipment. And the, in the more exotic case, even pre roll mill could be used. So basically you need uh, some sort of the equipment which creates high shear force and uh, the tubo matrix could be dispersed properly and we can explain it via our processing guides, uh, what is the quality control, what should be the mixing time, mixing energy, and et cetera, and et cetera. So uh, feel free to write the question yeah, uh, to our uh, webinar.axel.com. Yes, if uh, we can discuss more precisely your, your specific needs in case, of course. Okay, thank you, Vladimir. Uh, next question. Are your products USA TSCA approved without an SNUR? I'll handle this one, uh, Vladimir, since this is kind of my <laughs> sphere of influence. Uh, so the the EPA has stopped giving um, blanket TSCA uh, assignments to nano products because so much can depend on geometry, which just isn't visible. So now what they're doing is, is SNRs. That's how we say that word, SNR. And that is the mechanism by which <laughs> uh, the EPA... What's that? Um, and, and so that's the mechanism by which Go it's ahead. approved, uh, it is via a SNR. Um, the EPA won't be giving just, just blanket Tosca numbers anymore to nanomaterials because, uh, as I said, the difference between us and a multi-wall, us and a few wall or a branch nanostructure is, is so significant that now they're going to be very specific and go uh, basically part by part via a SNR. Next question, um, is there any advantage of having a tubular additive instead of sheet-like ones like graphene oxide? Yeah. So uh, okay. we know a lot about our product. What, what I have found that, that what I would call graphene platelets, whether those are you know a few sheets or, or many sheets, and whether they're synthesized or mined, what those are better at are, are barrier properties. And that's why we're seeing it being adopted in places like car wax 
uh, places like um, anti-corrosion coatings because these two-dimensional plates start to kind of collide together and create a barrier. Um, so an advantage for an application that required barrier properties, I think graphene platelets would work better than our material. Okay. I, I just can add a few things. Yes, that uh, graphene oxide, basically the working dose just to obtain electrical conductivity in the thermostat systems, it, it's a, it, sometimes it's a few percent, yes? So, or if we speak about reduced graphene oxide, it could be like 0 0.5 or percent depending on the resistance level which you are looking for. And at these dosages, of course, you will uh, for sure uh, could face with a uh, huge and perhaps uh, a negative impact on the color. Yes, your product will be black or gray uh, for sure, just because of the higher dosage of carbon itself in the system. And also the impact on the viscosity and thixotropic should be investigated. Yes, because if you add more in these things, uh, you have a uh, high impact in many cases, yes, depending on the structure of the additive, of course. Okay, uh, next question. What is the difference between these additives and carbon nanotubes in terms of chemistry? Uh, I think we partially answered this question, yes, because it's a, it's a structure itself, yes, and everything corresponding to this, yes. Uh, nanotubes, they are, they are tubes, yes, like a 3D material. So it's uh, there are single wall carbon nanotubes or multi wall uh, graphene nanotubes. They have different, let's say, uh, the mixing procedure sometimes even different just because uh, the nanotubes, they can be in the bundles which should be dispersed properly. The multi wall CNT, I mean, uh, they are a little bit different here. And the same for the uh, graphene oxide. And uh, in this question, yes, it mentioned other additives. Maybe it's better to rewrite uh, what does it mean. But if we look on the carbon-based additives like carbon black, carbon nanotubes, graphene nanotubes, or single carbon nanotubes, which uh, Jan covered a lot uh, this webinar, and graphene oxide. So the basically, of course, the structure itself is different, yes. And uh, uh, the working mechanism exactly. and the dispersion mechanism, the percolation mechanism, they are different in, in different formulations, yes. So uh, sometimes similar, but to be honest, in the uh, in the particular life, they're completely different. Yes. Yeah, and our product is synthesized. I think sometimes you can encounter graphene platelets in the market that are actually mined, and large hunks of graphite are exfoliated down to a certain number of levels to where they they're considered to be graphene. Um, so there's there there are a lot of very fundamental differences. But I think it starts with the geometry. We're we're a little three dimensional filament. They're kind of a flat rock slash sheet. Okay, um, next question. Can your product be used in 100% UV curable coatings? Oh, uh, can I cover this, yeah, Jan? Uh, yes, uh, very simple answer, yes, it's possible. Yes, it's possible. Uh, I recommend, yes, uh, again, uh, to send uh, the, the, your request or the description of the formulation, yes, uh, to our webinar, docaxel.com, and we can provide the specific grade of tubo matrix, yes, for the acrylic, metacrylic, or different types of resin uh, UV cured, yes, and uh, provided the mixing recommendation and uh, explain the, let's say, the potential uh, technical, yeah, let's say, challenges which could be overcome depending on the dosage you will get and etc. Uh, yes, it could be used. Good answer. Um, there is another type. I'm oh, sorry. sorry. There is another type of carbon nanotubes like we've heard that we've heard about, uh, multi-wall carbon nanotubes. What is the difference with your material? Uh, Vladimir? Yeah, you me? Yeah, okay, great. Uh, so again, it's the difference is the structure itself, yes. Uh, uh, we produce and supply industrial volume of single wall carbon nanotubes. So basically the diameter as it was demonstrated in the screen is uh, very short. Yes, and it's really uh, uh, like a tube made with a one atom of carbon as a thickness, yes, uh, the wall. Multi-wall carbon nanotubes, uh, basically the commercial grades which are available on the market, they are from, uh, let's say 10 to 30, sometimes even more walls. So basically the diameter is different, the length is different. They have a little bit different impact on the viscosity and thixotropic. And the most important from the property point of view, yes, the dosages which will be used, they are higher. Yes, it's a few percent or let's say 0.5% or something like this. Uh, 
around these values and again at these dosages for sure you will lose for the color even if you get the permanent conductivity and uh, you have to optimize your formulation yes somehow to pass the viscosity in fixotropic from single carbon tubes of course depending on the dosage there is also the impact on the viscosity and fixotropic but according to our experimental study and the pattern feedback of course it's uh, limited because the dosage of active material is lower than basically 0.05% of active material and less than 0.5% of the predispersed concentrate to Okay. Yeah. I, I think I, we have time I, I would for just one say, last question. Sorry, go ahead, Ian. Oh, no, no. I was just going to say commercially, I, I see multi-walls being considered more often when people are trying to do some sort of mechanical reinforcement of, of the resin systems because multi-walls are, are stiff kind of spiny structures where it's just kind of a soft flexible filament so uh, yeah like steel rebar if you were adding it to, in, into a system yeah uh, I, I can read just one more sentence here maybe as well from the product and commercial availability point of view yes there are some predispersed uh, multi-wall CNT solution based on the resin but in the resin the dosages some Sometimes it's quite low and uh, there is a problem of sedimentation during the storage and transportation. And we as Excel, we decided to move uh, a little bit in different direction to design a high dosage concentrate. And there are plenty of benefits uh, from this approach, yes. The dosage is high, so you put less care in the system, yes. And of course, the product is more stable. But it's, it's some sort of uh, general opinion from my side, which I uh, see on the market last year. Um, okay, we have time for one more question. What is the impact on polymeric film thickness? One more. This is it. Okay. Uh, there is no impact on the film thickness itself. Yes, I mean, uh, uh, basically, we have applications like 5 to 10 microns and nanotubes are used, yeah? And we are s s selling... Uh, uh, and supplying the material to the, for example, like in Europe, it's uh, self-leveling floors and the thickness sometimes is up to two millimeters, yes, which is a lot. Uh, so basically in various applications, nanotubes could be used and there is no impact on the film thickness itself, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I know we encountered in the ESD floor uh, space here in the U.S., where thicker coatings would have a detrimental effect to traditional conductive additives. They'd start to fall out of the system if it was too thick. Um, we don't have that issue. Uh, the nanotubes kind of stay in place, uh, it more or less entangled in, in the resin and the additives. Well, that's all the time we have today for questions. Please join me in thanking Ian Fellows and Vladimir, as well as a big thank you to our sponsor, Oxyl. If you have any additional questions or comments, please don't hesitate to uh, click on the email us button on the console. And as you exit today's webinar, please take a few minutes to complete our survey. We strongly recommend your detailed comments. Please visit our website uh, for the archive of this presentation, as well as information about other upcoming events. Again, we appreciate your time and hope you found this webinar uh, valuable. Thank you so much for joining us today.